Why, hello everyone, uh, and welcome back to, I suppose, our kind of conversations that we have on Friday where we look at different terms, different terms of art, uh, and different other kind of like methods and modes of communication and discourse uh, that we should just know basically for our, to further our capabilities and capacities to speak uh, informatively, persuasively, uh, however we're speaking to the public. Uh, and so today, the first thing we're going to do is really just talk about visuals for a little bit. Uh, for the most part, I wanted to have a conversation on kind of like visuals and visual aids and how they can better enhance uh, the overarching like quality of a speech. Uh, at any given time, date, or place. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple different types of it. Uh, this is going to be the continuation of the lecture on Wednesday. I didn't want to just jump into this because I just didn't have enough time uh, based upon trying to get the also speech anxiety into the conversation uh, and look at the different kind of visuals that you could potentially use or utilize or may encounter when you're speaking uh, in person or digitally in the future. Uh, and also have a brief kind of conversation about like good PowerPoint habits. Uh, this will be probably like a 10 to 20 minute video. Uh, you can leave it on in the background uh, and just kind of pay attention to it. Or at least if you want to, uh, you could probably skip ahead to if you know what kind of visual you're using uh, to the section that's relevant, probably a PowerPoint. And that'll probably be in the later part of kind of the clip. Once you see me transition from this slide to an actual PowerPoint, that's probably when you can just like pick up on the video and pay attention then. Uh, and so without further ado, there's no like quiz or anything due this week. Uh, and I hope everyone's having a fantastic weekend. Without uh, more conversation, let's just uh, jump into it. I will put an image of myself up here in the corner uh, so you can see me. OK. Uh, as you can tell, this was meant uh, to be covered in class, but we're not. So there's a bunch of different types of visual aids, and they all serve different purposes for whenever we're speaking. The main goal is always to enhance the presentation that we are utilizing. For a large uh, chunk of communicatory history, individuals thought that visuals did not communicate uh, in a traditional sense. They didn't make arguments. They didn't make uh, that kind of neo-Aristotelian uh, understanding of what is good discourse, what is good communication, what are good ways, or at least avenues uh, to persuade a public uh, at large. What we know today is that that is completely false uh, and not true whatsoever. Uh, visuals sometimes are more impactful and more meaningful than even uh, words themselves, because there's a lot of visuals and images that will stick with us, that will linger with us, uh, more so than even a great speech that you could easily forget a lot of the components or a lot of the parts to it. Uh, this is the way in which you can make kind of an impactful uh, moment of memory uh, for that kind of collective uh, symbolic moment that you share with whoever you are speaking to at that time point. Uh, and so there's different types that we utilize. Most pragmatically for this class, most of you will use a PowerPoint, uh, and that is totally fine and reasonable. But if you just wanted to have like a singleized image uh, or make a handout for the class, that's totally fine too. Uh, other modes are things such as overhead projector slides, uh, which are kind of antiquated at this point, which probably need to update it, but still in that some low tech areas, which you'll encounter at different points. Uh, in the country, in the world, uh, it's a lot easier where you have to sometimes use an overhead projector and put things up on a screen is kind of uh, a thing that you should at least consider or at least think about if you're going to be speaking to a lot of people, uh, generally speaking. Next up are whiteboard or chalkboard drawings. Sometimes you can have a flip chart. Sometimes you can have videos. Uh, videos are great visual aids, but they're also very distracting because it requires a lot of audience attention and a lot of kind of putting themselves into it, uh, into the what their images that they're watching. And because we've been conditioned so much by like television, YouTube, and a lot of the technological uh, things that we always have at our disposal, it also puts the audience in a different state of being, which we just need to uh, kind of account for, because once they start watching a movie, they go into movie mode. They're no longer in, I am listening to kind of the speech that I'm listening to mode. Uh, and we can have props. Maybe if you wanted to give a speech on cats and you held up your cat mug, that could be your easy visual to show how much you love cats. Boom, we have a visual, we call it a day. Uh, it's really weird for me to talk about visuals and the need to include a visual in your speech, particularly when we do this, because in a lot of ways you already are by merely having a camera in front of you and pointing it on you. You are a visual aid uh, in your own speech because of how the digital world works. Uh, and so I suppose we are a visual within a visual, which is creating some sort of visual inception uh, that I'm going to think a little le be less about because that is totally irrelevant to everything we were doing anyway. 
So graphs and charts are typically uh, the thing that most people think of when they think of visuals in a PowerPoint setting, whether it's talking to a room full of people you need to convince to do something or take some sort of action. Uh, and we need to be able to look at data at a glance and kind of look at a bunch of information while being able to explain it to an audience, but having enough of it that it is self-explanatory in a lot of ways. Uh, the main goal with a visual is to kind of have it enhance the speech in the sense that it is giving information, but it is not redundant with the information that you are presenting within the visual. Uh, and that is a very important distinction, or at least on a moment of understanding to make, uh, because you want to use kind of the data or you want to use the evidence, you want to use whatever is on the screen as kind of the force in which you can further explain something about it or lead the audience to interpret the data in a manner uh, in which you would like. So here's a fun chart uh, of just, let's look at a one that 538 promoted out of the Biden Trump election. Uh, and so what we can see here is that if I just threw this kind of uh, visual on the screen for the most part, so I could just save the image, uh, throw it whatever folder I wanted to throw it to. Uh, when we would go over here, uh, we can just go to our slide and insert image, upload for the computer, wherever it is we saved it, desktop, boom. Okay, we can easily throw in a visual to whatever it is we are trying to do uh, whenever we're trying to do it and have it be kind of part of the package. Maybe I'm giving a speech on who is most likely to win the upcoming election. Uh, and I want to have a bullet list of arguments and talk about specific things, uh, or I wanted to talk about polls at this point in time. And I could have this be just a refer on in the background for how individuals interpret polls, interpret poll data, and what it means uh, to overtly signify something as a mode of probability understanding uh, for other individuals when it comes to understanding how polls work or something along those lines. Uh, I could have that easily by using this 538 chart and graph, and I would make sure I give them credit to it because I'm straight up stealing it right now, uh, and be able to talk about it in conjunction to uh, the slide that I have put up and put kind of together. All right, uh, I'm not really going to go over these other modes uh, as much as I thought I was going to, because it's going to be kind of uh, a little bit redundant. But other things you could have for visuals is if you had a chalkboard or a whiteboard or even a large kind of like post-it uh, page sheet flip chart behind you, you could totally write on it uh, for the most part. And that always has a moment where it feels a little bit more authentic. It's the same reason I miss uh, being in classroom spaces and being able to write things on a board, uh, because it feels more real. It feels more like it has that kind of like mode of authenticity that you don't necessarily get outside of the space, uh, which is something I always uh, kind of miss. But it would be kind of hard to do it in a digital sense because you'd have to like hold it up to the screen when you could easily just uh, kind of produce it yourself. Now, there are ways in which I am not going to go into right now that you can do it via things like Zoom uh, that you could easily go to the chalkboard uh, whatever add-on it is for that and just you share your screen to be uh, that chalkboard thing. So I don't know if I can she screen share a screen share, uh, but this would be the easiest way to do it. Yeah, what I could do instead is just throw up a whiteboard from the screen share uh, and just do it manually. So I want to talk about cats today uh, and how uh, cat facts are totally cool or something along those lines. I can easily just write up and have a lot of that kind of flexibility that you have uh, when you have that space. If you're going to draw uh, or write something, you can totally do that too. But my drawing and writing capabilities are very awful. Uh, and so we are not going to do that. Now let's get back to the proper screen share. OK, uh, next up is we have. Uh, Next up is we have overhead slides. Uh, usually low tech areas have this happen. When I taught in a nationality room in the University of Pittsburgh, uh, I had to use overhead slides because there was no technology in the room. It was one of the cultural studies rooms that was a part of when the university was being built, they ran out of money on the bottom floors uh, of this giant cathedral of learning, which is a stupid tall building that you should Google sometime. It's really pretty, uh, but they ran out of money on the bottom floors and they allowed uh, different nationalities to donate a bunch 
bunch of money to have their own kind of cultural room in it. Uh, I was teaching and I believe the Japanese room, which at the time didn't really have uh, technology built into the room. And so it was kind of awful in that sense. So I had to use a bunch of overhead projector slides. But here are some things that you should think about is that it requires a lot of preparation in advance uh, that you don't normally think about anymore of how you're going to organize things. And also the lighting from projector slides uh, is something that you have to account for. So you have to position it, you have to position your audience uh, in all sorts of little nuances that you just kind of want to have in the back of your head. Next up are paper handouts. If you're ever handing out paper, uh, you're going to notice something. It's really annoying. Uh, everyone hates it. The audience hates it because they have to pass it to another human being. They have to look at it. They now have this piece of paper that they don't want uh, for the most part. Uh, you're going to hate it because you're going to have to stand there silently as your audience is handing out things to one another, uh, even if you get the best case scenario of volunteers uh, to pass it out for you. It's still going to be time consuming. It's still going to interrupt the first part of your speech. Uh, and so you just kind of have to think about it for the most part of just like, do I want a large chunk of time to be wasted? And do I want a little bit of annoyance? Is the thing that I am putting on that kind of handout uh, more worth uh, than the <laughs> uh, than the kind of like rest of the annoyances or the rest of the negativities uh, that would be associated? All right. Uh videos. We already talked about this. Uh they're very uh, a second ago, they're very kind of audience engaged for the most part. And so the audience has to do a lot of work whenever there's a video involved and not a lot of work, but they're very kind of, they pull the attention of the audience member very highly to whatever it is that they are watching. Uh, and usually requires the rest of the room to be darker, which puts everybody into a more relaxed state. Now, this is good if you need to show a video clip of maybe a scene from your favorite movie, or maybe uh, something that was a moment that was a documented in time that needs to be seen by the audience uh, to fully understand the gravity uh, of the situation at hand. Now, those are the answers or the times you want to use videos. If not, I highly recommend not using videos because they will uh, be something in which you are put against in competition from. Uh, and so a lot of times you're going to say to yourself, OK, I'm producing uh, this kind of recorded video for my audience member, but I'm putting this like highly uh, scripted, highly recording video right beside me. You're always Always going to look worse in comparison uh, to how much time and effort went into the other thing. Not always. I mean, you could out uh, do the video that you are playing, uh, and sometimes you would. It's just always contextual upon the thing that it is we are talking about. Uh, and so let's transition from here. Uh, I always like to talk more about PowerPoints uh, and things that are good practices in PowerPoints. Uh, this is just like my favorite photo of all time. I was visiting my mother one night, and she was feeding some cats that like live outside, uh, and this little guy showed up one night uh, and she's standing there terrified at the door and I'm just like that is the cutest uh, little raccoon of all time. I am the world's biggest fan of trash pandas. They are amazing. Okay so let's go over here. Uh, and talk a little bit more about visual aids in the PowerPoint sense. since I know a lot of you are going to utilize this. When you do do your PowerPoint, uh, you can always do what I'm doing right now. Say you're in Zoom. If you do screen share uh, and share your screen, it'll show everything on the screen. If you want to include the computer sounds, you click the button at the bottom. Uh, if you're going to use the Panopto system, a uh, uh, attached to this video will be another video about how to do it. Actually, I'll just go over it right now and we'll just keep everything in the same uh, kind of vein and function. Uh, and so let me bop over really quick and not share that screen because I don't want you to see passwords and stuff. Oh no, I need to find my phone. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, you can come back to me. Uh, all right, uh, let's bop over to the Panopto system. Oh, the Panopticon is always watching. It's that system of power, AKA that French philosopher Foucault talks about the prison, AKA the Panopticon, in which you need one guard to watch hundreds of thousands of prisoners because it's structured uh, at the top where you can always be looking down and monitoring them. And even if you're not monitoring them, they assume you're monitoring them uh, because the potential and capacity for it to exist. Now, does that exist in the digital age when we're always recording each other? I'll let you find out or be the judge of the dystopic uh, future, which we have approached. Uh, okay, so all you have to do is bob over here to create open Panopto. Jaya, yeah, open. Oh, now we have a recording within a recording. 
we have recording sessions. Uh, so it's using my other camera. This camera is not as good as the other camera. But anyway, uh, for Panopto, all you have to do uh, is just hit capture of the main screen. It'll capture everything that's on the screen. Just hit play uh, for the most part, and you'll be able to see your PowerPoint. You'll also be able to just open it up uh, in here and be able to see it uh, also on the recording screen. And that way, whenever you start going over to your PowerPoint, all you have to do is just hit uh presentation view from beginning uh and then you can just click all right uh so whenever we think about kind of the Whenever we think about technology, or at least what we're recording and what we're doing, I wish I could show you my other screen now. Actually, I can. I'm just being lazy. Here we go. Uh, so whenever we see this, you'll see a presentation view sometimes uh, with a screen that you're sharing. If you have a second monitor, I highly recommend using the presentation view. Uh, I'm assuming you can see this right now and if you can't i apologize it looks something along the lines of this uh for the most part uh and you're able to set up your own notes uh and things that you want to talk about on the screen so that you if you wanted to have a large chunk of text that you're going to read which i highly recommend never doing but if that uh, is kind of the safe thing for you to do as you are presenting let me close panopto so it stops turning on both monitors one's enough uh if you're if that makes you feel better with how you are presenting then I highly recommend you kind of do so. Uh, and so all you have to do in this world uh, is set it up in a way that is just like, okay, uh, here's something that is large chunks of text, large chunks of notes that I can look down at, uh, but while continually trying to make eye contact with the camera and continually trying to have that like high level of delivery uh, and focus what, whatever it is you are talking to or whoever it is you are talking to uh, and being able to have that kind of like conversational approach uh, and or tone. Uh, and so when we have a visual and visual slides, the first thing we want to do is always have a set of consistency. We want the font uh, to look the same. We want the punctuation to be the same. I threw in a period in there just to show you uh, that it catches the eye whenever the punctuation is different. If you're going to cap capitalize all of the letterings in a way or manner or style. Make sure you do it throughout the entirety uh, of the thing for the most part. Any of these little discrepancies or anything that is a problem or different uh, is going to capture the audience's attention. And what we don't want is the audience staring at your PowerPoint slide instead of listening to you. Because at the end of the day, you are the kind of sole agent actor. You are the autonomous figure, not uh, the actual PowerPoint, which is meant to enhance uh, the overall aid of the presentation and scope and not just kind of detract from it through uh, whatever it is you are doing. And so keeping it simple uh, is always, always, always going to be uh, the best thing you want to do. Uh, and so not having those complete sentences where you're just reading a manuscript to me uh, or reading uh, the entirety of your speech uh, is going to be a better way to approach it because we do not want to have a joint reading session together. Uh, and the second thing is in this idea of simplification. So making sure we have the short sentences that are easy uh, to comprehend really quickly and direct and lead uh, the audience is going to be most ideal. And the second is going to be use contrasting colors so that it's easier to read. I've seen so many PowerPoints where I have to sit, spend so much time like squinting and hurting my eyes because the font is like red and it's on like a black background. Uh, and while it hypothetically looks cool and those colors work together and create a contrast, uh, it also kind of like can bleed together in a way that's just like not very appropriate to being able to see uh, what with anything that it is that you are doing. Uh, and what also not to do uh, is I know some of you like to have things like this uh, that are motion and mobile. Uh, they're fun in a sense that you can have a couple of them sometimes and it won't be a problem. If you have this in an entire PowerPoint presentation for even like five minutes, uh, it's going to get really gaudy and it's also going to get really kind of annoying at different points in times. Uh, and so if you ever give a slide and you're thinking to yourself, I'm just gonna put all the information on the slide, this is what it sounds like. And I'm just doing this to give you an example of what I watch whenever I watch a PowerPoint where people just read the entire time. For instance, in my presentation, I have decided to include a large chunk of just text that I'm going to read verbatim to the audience. At this point in time, we are having a joint reading session, which might be good around campfires, but is certainly not a product that enhances your speech as opposed to detracting from it. 
that was not good because we're just, we're not doing anything. There is something that is doing work. I am doing the exact same work as the thing that is already doing work. Uh, and there's just a large redundancy that is wasting the time of both the speaker and the audience member that could uh, be doing a lot more uh, whenever it is or whatever it is they are doing. So. Also, the last thing I wanted to add is if you're going to have imaging, uh, always make sure you have quality imaging for the most part. Uh, so high resolution is typically better. Try not to use clip art. I know a lot of people like to use clip art. I think it looks stupid. I think a lot of other people look, think it looks stupid. Uh, but it's just one of those things that like too much clip art is just like, okay, this guy that needed to just draw some doodles. Uh, Microsoft gets stole their work and was just like, ah, oh, free use. Uh, is not kind of like an image that I really want to see, but if you want to throw books and stuff on the page, that's totally fine. It's just not for me, uh, but it could be, there's no general rule for it. Uh, just less clip art is the better. Uh, and also your images always want to complement the text. So if I'm giving a speech on poverty, uh, I could show the famous photo of the migrant mother. Uh, so what I can do is go here. So what I could do uh, is show the famous Dorothea Lang photo of the migrant mother that everyone knows. So I can easily just save the image. Uh, and if you don't know the photo, you should know the photo. Uh, where are we at? All right, and I could easily just drop it in here by going to insert pictures from this device. I don't know why I'm talking like this onto the desktop, my grid's mother. Hello, my grid's mother. Uh, and I just wanted this to be the image that I have on the screen. I could totally do that and that would totally be fine uh, for the most part because this is a very powerful image and a very powerful picture uh, that tells a lot of a story or narrative that's going to do a lot of work on its own end. So what I can do instead is start having a different conversation. Uh, and I wouldn't actually use uh, the, if I was going to use this photo, I probably would either shrink it super much and put it into its own corner or its own area. Uh, to give it kind of its own sense of text area in the slide. I would never make it its entire photo unless I did make it its entire page and I would make sure that it covered the entire page uh, to not detract from the powerful nature of the inherent photo that is being produced or at least put on the screen uh, evidently. PowerPoint also loves to do a thing where it's just like, how can we make this really trendy and cool? Uh, I will say it's fine uh, to do so. Uh, I don't know how to undo that. Control Z maybe? Uh, perfect. I will say that it's going to be fine to do that if you're just using a regular image and you want it to look a little bit better. Uh, don't do it with a famous image like the migrant mother or else you are just committing uh, some sort of travesty against art, humanity, and poverty, and you hate people. Uh, so don't do that against anything that's too famous. I'm not actually being serious, but I'm being kind of serious. So uh, read through that as you will. Uh, the last thing I wanted to include if you're doing a PowerPoint is do not, please do not use timers, just don't. Just don't do it. It's a bad habit. Uh, the only time you're going to use a timer, uh, you're going to have a terrible time if for something, something happens in your speech and you're over time or something happens in your under time. And then all of a sudden your PowerPoint's freaking out and just acted on its own. You don't want that. You are con in control of the situation. Time is not in control of you in the situation. Uh, I'm pretty sure teachers that tell you to use timers uh, are just trying to make it as simple as possible for you. And that is not a good practice uh, to set up in the first place. And so try your best not to use them. Now, if in another class I tell you to use a timer, use a timer. Uh, but it is one of those things that uh, always becomes, you become kind of referent uh, to this abstract or vague notion of time and timing. And if you want to use a timer, just use a timer. You have tons of technology surrounding you. Uh, throw up a timer, put it beside you and manually track it yourself uh, so that you know when to transition because you want everything to be smooth. You want everything to be natural. You don't uh, ever want to put yourself into more anxiety, uh, into an already anxiety inducing situation by able uh, to be able to like monitor it yourself and create your own transitions as you continually talk. Uh, and so that's kind of what I have for it today in PowerPoints and recordings. Uh, if you have any questions on any of the recording stuff and any of the creation of the PowerPoint, uh, please let me know. Uh, shoot me an email or shoot me a text uh, or come to office hours on Tuesday, Thursday, or come to the class on Wednesday, or uh, I will make another non-mandatory class on Friday that anyone can come in and ask questions to. Uh, 
please use me as a resource. Uh, I hope everyone's having a great day and I will see you next week.